you've missed any part of this series over the last two years, you can go online to YouTube and you can catch up on any of the parts that you missed. You can also go in the church app or on the website for this year or anything that you missed. This morning we're in Luke chapter 24. Now, how many of you are really good at finding things that are lost or hard to see? How many of you are good at that? Raise your hand. If you're online, say, I'm good. Just type that in there. Okay, I see a lot of hands up. I am not one of those. My hand is not up. I, I, number one, I'm not very observant. I walk into a room and like, and like later on, Julie be like, hey, did you notice anything new in the living room? I'm like, <gasps> I don't notice anything new. What's going on? I start looking around panicking because I can't figure it out. Well, she probably worked hard on something, you know, and I missed it. And then I remember as a kid, my dad um, used to love tomato soup. Now, I don't know if he loved it, but he did eat it a lot. So um, there's a huge pantry in our basement, at least in my memory. It was this huge pantry. They had square shelving, and we had all the stuff in the basement. And they would send me to the basement to get the tomato soup. And I would get down there, and I would look, and I'm like, it's not here. And my dad would yell down, yes, it is. It's right there. Just grab it. And I would look and look. And finally, it was long enough to where you would hear the footsteps of thunder coming down the steps. You know, and I'm sure it was a lot worse than it really was. But, man, it, it sounded loud in my memory. And, and he would go down. And he would go right to the tomato soup. And he would grab it. And he would look at me with that look. Like, what's the matter with you, son? And... And I couldn't find it. And it still happens today. And Julie knows better not to ask me to find something in the pantry. Because as soon as someone asks me, the pressure is on. And all of a sudden, I go blind. And I can't see it. But a lot of you raised your hand. I'm sure some of you put online that you were good. So we're going to give you a little test to see how good you are at finding things. So we're going to put a picture on the screen that is um, a, a picture. Since we're getting close to Christmas, and since Sam's Club already has Christmas decorations up, we're going to go ahead and put a picture of Christmas bags on the screen. However, in there is hidden somewhere is one Christmas card. And we're going to see if you can find the Christmas card, okay? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you like 30 seconds. Ready? Three, two, one, go. It, once you find it, go ahead and raise your hand, but don't say anything. Just raise your hand. And if you find it online, all right, someone already has it in the back. Keep, keep it raised. Keep it raised. All right, if you're online, say found it. Type in found it if you find it. Okay, wow. Wow, a bunch of hands going up. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, guys, let's give these guys a round of applause. Give them a round of applause online. All right. Now, there was quite a few hands, and some of you that said you were good. Like Julie, she raised her hand, and she found it. Now, go ahead and hit the answer slide. There it is. All right, there it is. There it is. Now, now, go back to the first picture, now, the original one, the, the guesty one. Now, isn't it interesting, keep that on the screen for a second, isn't it interesting that when you have a hard time finding something, it's so frustrating, but the moment that you can see it now, every time you look at that picture, what sticks out to you? The card, yeah, yeah, the card does. And, and you go ahead and, and uh, go back to the main slide. So here's the harsh reality, though is that even though some of you couldn't see it, the card was there the entire time. It was there. And we sometimes need help to see things. In the same way, in the same dimension of our spiritual journey, there are constantly things that we are unaware of that are right in front of us, and God wants to open our eyes and draw a red circle around it so we can see it. You know, we could go to work and not see the hand of God literally at work right in front of us. We could, go, we could even go to church and not see. We could go to school and not see. We could hold up sometimes our own ideas, our own ambitions, our own thoughts that kind of cloud and busy out the very work of God right in front of us. But as we conclude the Gospel of Luke series today, well, we're going to look at these disciples that walked with Jesus for three years, and they needed him to open their eyes even at the very end. And just like that, you and I desperately need, even if we've been following Jesus for a long time, we constantly need God's grace to open our eyes to see in a greater way. This morning, the slogan is super easy. If you could repeat the slogan with me today, say, Jesus, open my eyes. Those online, go ahead and type that in. 
see who can type faster and hit enter. That would be a fun little game. I'm always comp- doing competition. I turn everything into a competition. I love it. Jesus, open my eyes. Luke 24, verses 36 through 43 says, as they were talking about these things, this is the disciples, they were hiding in a room, they were scared, and the reason why they were scared is because their rabbi, their master, the one they thought was um, their savior, was crucified, and now they're, they don't know what to do, and they're afraid that the religious leaders are going to come after them next, because they're the disciples. So they're talking about the, the, the report of the women who saw that Jesus was alive, and how angels were uh, um, um, appeared to them, and there's all this discussion going on, and Jesus himself all of a sudden stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they, start, they were startled and frightened. They thought they saw a spirit. They're like, it's a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do, you, why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is my, I myself. Touch me and see. He's showing them the scars. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when I had... And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were still disbelief for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you had anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of Chick-fil-A. No, I'm just kidding. No, I mean, it's Jesus chicken, but no, they didn't give him Chick-fil-A. They gave him broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before them. And I love this because Jesus, in their fear, in their disillusionment, in their wondering, now that they're hearing reports that Jesus was alive from the woman, they don't believe, you know, they don't believe the woman at all. And, you, and then you have the, the people on the road to Emmaus come back and say, no, it's true. He walked with us and our hearts burned as he showed us the scriptures. And they're talking about this thing and Jesus shows up right in their midst and he says, peace. And I love this because Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Everywhere he goes, he brings peace. So whatever situation that you are facing right now, when you invite Jesus into your space, into your heart, into the room, you're also inviting peace. Peace will always be the result. That's why you're encouraged every time you read the scriptures in the New Testament, there's so much encouragement of gathering together and worshiping and seeking him because his life and peace are entered into the situation. I love what this one scholar, R.T. France, he brings out a little, something a little bit deeper. He says, within the third gospel, the word peace, which is shalom, is, ac- is actually closely associated with the other Greek word, salvation. So because of, this is so cool when you catch this, because of Jesus' death, his followers did not believe he was the Messiah any longer. They thought Jesus had failed to bring salvation to Israel. But yet, when he walks into the room, he says, peace or salvation over them because he's alive. He is bringing salvation into the room. He's bringing peace into the room because he is not dead. He has not failed. He's alive. And I love the fact that Luke makes their point to share that Jesus had a resurrected body. You say, Jeremy, why is this a big deal? Most people don't mention this in this passage. They just obviously talk about his resurrection, which is important. But I love what Christopher uh, West, the author, writes, that our bodies matter to God. That we get a resurrected body. Now, and it's, it's very interesting, that, and this is one of the reasons why we're going to do the sexuality series in November, is because our sexuality and our bodies are spiritual. That somehow there's this dichotomy that people think spirit good, body bad, and that, but the reality is that we, we, we can't dichotomize our humanities, that we're body, mind, spirit, soul, and it's all integrated, and one affects the other, and therefore our bodies matter to God. And so he shows up in this resurrected body, which um, we, we see him, you know, begin to eat, which is so amazing that he has this resurrected body and he eats, which on a side note, they ate in the Garden of Eden before sin. Now, they probably weren't eating uh, McDonald's or like deep fried Oreos like you're going to get after church today at the speed light after party, but I'm sure it was good, uh, whatever it was. But he eats this broiled fish because he wants to show them he's not a ghost. That he's alive. He's real. See the scars in my hands and my feet. I died, but I conquered death because I am the king. I am Lord. Everyone say, Jesus, open my eyes. 
Go ahead and type that one more time online. Thanks for tracking with me. Verse 44 says this. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. I love these verses because Jesus reminds them after they're, they're starting to become convinced that he really is alive, that all this had been, has been, uh, was it written in the scriptures and was prophesied that it was going to be taking place. And he specifically mentions the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That it was there the entire time, but people missed it. They didn't understand. They were blinded to the truth of God's word by their own ambitions, by their own prejudices, and by their own personal desires. See, while Israel was expecting a military king, Jesus shows them it was written long, long ago, even before they were born, that the Messiah was going to suffer, and he was going to die, but he was going to rise again. And I love that some, the scholars remind us that Jesus did not discredit the Old Testament, but he brought it into its proper context. See, all the Old Testament pro was, was full of prophecies. As a matter of fact, you're in for a treat today. You should be glad that you came. You'll get it online too as well. You'll be glad you tuned in. Is that When you leave today and you get ready to go to the Connection Center for, to, uh, to uh, pay for the Speed of Light lunch, there's going to, you're going to get a handout that's going to have all the prophecies of the Old Testament that prophesied that Jesus was going to come and die and rise again. So there's tons of prophecies, and you're going to get them on a handout so you can see how amazing the Old Testament is and how it's all connected and how we need it. So Jesus opened my eyes. You know, there was this two men that went to court, and they were um, in this situation and the first um, lawyer got up and made an amazing argument to the judge. And it was very convincing. And so the, the, the judge said, that's right. That's right. And the other, other lawyer jumped and said, wait a minute, you haven't heard our argument yet. He says, oh, okay, go ahead. And he went and he gave a very eloquent speech and, and very convincing. And finally, the judge said, you know, that's right. And, and then the plaintiff jumped up and said, wait a minute, judge, they both can't be right. And he says, that's right. <laughs> and we have, we have to be careful that when we read Scripture, that we do not make it say what we want it to say. See, the, the disciples thought Jesus was going to be a military leader, but Jesus showed them clearly all throughout the Old Testament that that was not true. That it was prophesied the Messiah was going to come, suffer, and die, and rise again. Their eyes were open. And we have to be careful in, that we do not approach Scripture with the mindset that there are, you know, 25 different interpretations. No, there's one meaning to the Scripture. Now, God, in His amazing illumination of His Spirit, takes that Scripture and He applies it to our hearts in different circumstances and different ways. But there is an original meaning to the text. Now, is there anybody who, cl who can claim to have 100% accuracy and know it all and have it all right? Absolutely not. I don't, you don't, nobody does. However, it's important that we do not take our own prejudices, our own desires, and our own ambitions and place them on top of the truth of God's word. Thank you, Jesse. I was going to wait, I was going to wait, I was going to wait, I was waiting it out, I was waiting it out. So, that's why it's important to be connected to the body of Christ. Because it's the body of Christ that helps keep heresy at bay. It's the body of Christ where we could, you can be in a life group, or you could be on a Sunday morning talking to someone, and you could share kind of what you think, and it's the body of Christ where we can say, no, that's actually not. Let me show you why. Because we look at the scripture in context, and over here it says this, and over here it says that. And you look at it collectively together to get the truth of God's word. And so we stay connected to the body, and we stay connected to each other. And so here's a great prayer to pray as you read the scriptures um, on a daily basis. Psalm 119, 118 says this. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. Or that's not what it says on the screen. Okay. 
All right. Well, open my eyes to see the wonderful truth in your instructions. That's a powerful prayer that the psalmist prayed so that, you know what, I don't want to bring my own ambition, and I don't want to belittle this, and I'm not trying to get it on a soapbox. I'm just saying, as your shepherd, we have to be careful that we don't make the scriptures say what we want to say because, you know what, you can go to TikTok, and you can go to YouTube, and you can go to any social media platform and hear whatever you want to hear. I, I, hear all, I see all sorts of stuff online, but just because somebody has a title to their name and they're on TikTok or they're on YouTube or they're on Facebook doesn't make them um, accurate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, we, 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 we have to hold each other to the truth of God's word, and we need our eyes to be open. And so that's a wonderful prayer to pray, Lord Jesus, open my eyes. The next few verses, verse 47 and 48 says this, and that... And that Jesus says, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. So Luke writes at the very end of his letter, the culmination of everything that has been building to is that the lordship of Jesus Christ, he, his death, his resurrection, and in a few minutes we're going to see his ascension, and he's now commissioning his disciples to take this message of forgiveness of sins to the entire world, everywhere they go. You know, it's kind of like this. If I um, called one of you on stage and I, um, you know, had a, a $10 bill in my hand and I said, you know, Jonathan, you know what, would you like this $10 bill? What would you say? Yeah, yeah, he didn't hesitate in that one. He said, he was saying yes before I finished the question. And, and so, yeah, he would, say, he would say yes. And I would say, okay, Jonathan, you could have it. And then he, what does he have to do in order to, in order to receive that gift? Take it, yeah. First he has to believe that it's his. And then number two, he has to reach out and, and grab it and put it in his pocket. And in the same way, when it comes to the forgiveness of sins, you know, we go and we share this message so that people can grab hold of it and receive it, believe it and receive it. And I want to share with you some differences between religion and what the gospel of Jesus that we've been going through in the entire gospel of Luke is. Religion is all about doing. The gospel is all about receiving. Right? We're, we, just, we just read that Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. And now he's asking us to believe and receive. That's the gospel. Religion is, I'm going to work for God. The gospel is God, he, he works for me. I, I don't mean like he works for me like, like, he's the, like I'm the boss. But he did the work already for me. With religion, I obeyed to be accepted. That's religion. But with the gospel, I obey because I've already been forgiven and accepted. Right? With religion, I serve God out of fear and insecurity. But with the gospel, I serve God out of grateful love. With, the, with religion, my identity is based on how I measure up, and, and I don't measure up very well often. But with the gospel, my identity is based on his love, his grace, and his sacrifice. With religion, I feel pride when I measure up, and I feel shame when I fall short. But with the gospel, I don't feel pride nor shame because it's all been dependent on him anyways. Right? So Jesus, that's the gospel that we are called to proclaim. This message must be proclaimed to all nations, everywhere we go. And that's why this is so fitting that, that we're doing Speed the Light which is so funny because I promise you this was not strategically planned. But it is lined up that we're doing Speed the Light Sunday on this Sunday to where we are raising money so missionaries can have transportation and sound equipment all over the world. Because this gospel must be preached. Say, Jesus, open my eyes. And if you don't know what Speed the Light is, I want you to check out this powerful story on obedience to the Lord. Check this out. He was being told to run into the darkness in a remote part of India to a place he didn't know. There was nothing convenient about this. Nonetheless, he started running. Had someone passed him on the street at such a late hour, they might have asked, why are you running? Chilapa would have responded, I have 
no idea. Or maybe someone would have said, where are you going? Do you need a ride? I guess he would have said, I have no idea where I'm going. I only know that God woke me up and told me to ride. In the open country, away from the dim lights of the Indian villages, he passed the tree. In that instant, he sensed God wanted him to stop running and continue to reach. So I would did just that. With nobody in sight and nothing but an open field for our congregation, he proclaimed the grace of Jesus Christ. The life, death, and resurrection of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. At the end of his message, he gave an opportunity for anyone who could hear him to open their hearts to Christ's forgiveness. In the darkness, sobbing echoed through the open field. The tree branched parted above Jalapa's head, and a man began to climb down the tree. Tear-stained cheeks, the man in the tree gave his life to Jesus. When asked what he was doing at the top of the tree in the middle of nowhere, the man confessed, I came here to hang myself. I can imagine heaven standing at uneasy attention while the man climbed down the tree with his rope in his hand. The angels could have wondered, who would be filled with enough faith and willing to say yes to a leading of the spirit that doesn't make a lot of sense? What would our response be to such a leading? Today, God is calling us to serve humanity. Heaven could trust Jalapa with such an assignment. There are many others like the man in the tree who have no one to come to them in the darkness with the gospel and in the power of the spirit. They perish without knowing Jesus. The greatest injustice in all the earth is for someone to live and die without knowing Christ. This is the most basic human right. The spirit is leading and our obedience can be the answer to someone else's prayer until all know. Jesus opened my eyes. Isn't that a powerful story? He had no idea, but he was obedient. And just like that, God is calling you and I to go and take this message to our, our co-workers, to our neighbors, everywhere we go. Jesus opened my eyes. But here's the exciting thing. The last few verses of the Gospel of Luke, we see that Jesus doesn't just tell us to go and share this message, but then he gives us an amazing resource and the power to do so. In verse 49, it says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him, and he returned to Jerusalem, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, blessing God. So this mission is so vast, and this mission is so crucial that Jesus says, "You know what? I want you to go and wait till you receive the promise of the Father. I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to clothe you with the Spirit of God, with the power from on high." And that's why I'm excited that in starting off 2022, we're going to continue the story from Luke, who also wrote Acts, and it's one continuation of a story. We're going to go through the, gospel, the, the, the Acts of the Apostle in 2022 as we continue to learn about what the promise of the Father is. And Luke uh, talks about the importance of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And we're going to see on how we cannot fulfill this mission in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own creativity, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 51, it says that Jesus began to bless the, dis uh, the disciples as he began to ascend into heaven, as he departs. And Craig Keener points out that the priests uh, would often in the Old Testament lift their hands and give a priestly benediction and blessing over the people. You can find that in Numbers chapter 6. You can read that later on this week. So Jesus, the risen Christ, our high priest, who, was, who had been uh, mediating the forgiveness of our sins, is now lifting his hands and giving the blessing on his disciples. And he... Um, and there's two more points to do, uh, highlight as we wrap this up. Is this, first is this, is R.T. France points out that Jesus' earthly um, mission is now coming to an end. That this, this, is the, this is it. He's ascending and he's lifting his hands and his ministry is now coming to an end. But here's the amazing thing. As Jesus' ministry is coming to an end, he reaches out his hands and he blesses us because our ministry now begins. See, this is why church is so important, is that every time that you've ever had this thought or you felt, God, why don't you do something? What we're really praying or grieving in our hearts is saying, 
God, why don't I do something? Because God has now rose again. He defeated the enemy. He defeated sin. He defeated shame. He defeated guilt. He defeated lies. And he ascended, blessing his church to now go into all the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, now you go. You are the answer to the to this world. You are the ones carrying the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew, at the end of his Gospel, he has the ascension as well, but um, in the Greek, this is so cool, in the Gospel of Matthew, I don't want you to miss this, um, he says, um, to go make disciples of all nations, and in the Greek, um, the word uh, go, literally, and make disciples means as you go. And so many times we think, well, you know, I'm not a missionary, and, and I'm not going to go. And we're going to have opportunities in the coming years for you to take missions trips. It's going to be exciting. You should start saving now and planning now. It's going to be awesome. But really, when, when Matthew is saying, go make disciples, he's saying, as you live your life, go and make disciples. As you go to school, go and make disciples. As you go to work, go to making disciples. As you're golfing on the golf course, go and make disciples. And, and here's the amazing thing, is it's not about going to a new place as much as living with a new purpose. It's not as much about going to a new place to go on a missions trip. It's about living with a new purpose. So what if we begin to live our life like we were on a missions trip? We wake up in the morning and we're saying, Lord Jesus, open my eyes today, to, not only to see the wonderful truths in your instructions, but open my eyes to see the activity of God all around me. Because today is a day that you have made. Today is a day that you love people. Today is a day that you are looking for the prodigal sons to come home. Today is a day that you're going to restore and you're going to reheal. I want to be a part of that, God. So open my eyes to see. And you, if you want to work like that every single day, then all of a sudden it's not about punching in and punching out. It's about going and being in the hands and feet of Jesus. You're just getting paid for it. And if you can get a group of people, I'll say, I'm going to go for a number here. Let's say 11, because we know we lost Judas. But if you can get 11 people to live like that, you can change the world. You don't need 300. You don't need 200. You don't need a mega church. All you need is 11. Actually, probably all you need is one. Can we be the church that says, you know what? Jesus, I'm going to live the Great Commission. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Jesus, open my eyes. And here's the amazing thing is none of those disciples were, were fully educated like the way that we know education. None of them were great necessarily, you know, uh, amazing superstars. They were ordinary people like you and I, downriver, that said yes to Jesus. And when they saw his nail-scarred hands and they saw his feet, they said, this is for real. Our lives are surrendered to Jesus Christ. Let's go. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus. And they did. And we're here today because of that, because of their obedience. May there be other people a thousand years from now, if the, Jesus doesn't come back, that are knowing Jesus because of your and I obedience. Jesus, open my eyes. You can bow your heads and close your eyes as we wrap up this gathering. And I just have a uh, couple quick questions. The first is this, is maybe you're watching online or you're here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ before. Well, I want you to know that when he died on that cross, he died with you in mind. And he knows every sin that you've committed. He knows all the things that you may try to hide in the closet and all that he asks is that you bring it into the light. Because when you bring darkness into the light, darkness disappears. Jesus is the risen king. He rose again, and he's coming again for all who have put their faith and trust in him. And if you want to take that next step and cross the line to become a part of the family of Jesus, will you pray with me this morning? Just say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for playing God. I give you control. My faith and my trust is in you, the risen Christ. And I'm going to follow you, not to prove myself, but because I've already, I'm receiving your forgiveness right now. I want to spend the rest of my life living for you. In Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer online, just please click the raise hand button. We have prayer hosts 
and an online host ready to pray with you. If you're here in the gathering, go ahead and just uh, write on your communication card. Take it to the Connection Center. We'd love to follow up with you, follow up with you this week. And so here's a challenge for all of us. For the next seven days, when you wake up in the morning, before you leave the house, let's make this a prayer. Jesus, open my eyes. To, open my eyes today. Let's just pray that prayer for the next seven days together as a church family. And, and I want us to do this. Is when, you ha when God does something supernatural in, in your day, that you become aware that, wow, there's activity of God right in my midst, at my job, at my school, with my neighbors, or at, at Meyer, at Kroger, wherever it is. When you have a, that, that holy moment where your eyes are open, will you share it on our private Facebook group? And uh, we're not doing it to brag because I'm asking you to do it in the private group. Only those a part of one that family see it. But uh, we need to encourage each other. We need to spur each other on. And we need to celebrate with each other. We can't do that if we're not sharing it. And so will you just, if you have an aha moment this week as you're praying that prayer, will you uh, share it um, on, the, on the private group? I'd greatly appreciate it. So I'm going to pray a closing prayer. Then I'm going to have my, uh, uh, my daughter Bethany and Ali Miskel come up. And they're going to give you uh, some instructions, and they're going to pray over the food as we transition into the Speed the Light um, um, after party. So God, thank you for this message. Thank you that you, are first and foremost, are alive. <laughs> you are on the throne. You ascended. And as you ascended, you blessed your church. You blessed your followers. And you said, go and take this message to the nation. Jesus, break our hearts for what breaks yours. There's so many people that need you. Lord, thank you for the story of Chalapo who, who didn't know, but he just felt in his spirit that he needed to run, and he ran, and then he stopped by an empty field in a tree because you loved that one individual who was going to hang and take their life. And God, you love every one of our coworkers, every one of our neighbors. You love that person who's addicted to drugs, who's on, God, who's um, alcoholic. You love those who are constantly doing marijuana because they can't stand their life. They just want to numb the pain. God, you love every single individual. And you've placed all of us in strategic locations, God, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So, Lord, open our eyes this week. Lord, here we are. Use us. Lord, we're going to make a pre-choice choice right now. We're going to say what you want us to say. We're going to go what you, when you tell us to go. We're going to wait when you tell us to wait. We're going to do what you tell us to do because you are Lord. And you love people. And we want to be a part of that. Lord, we just, I just pray your blessing on this congregation. And those, our congregation, online and in person, Lord, everywhere they go this week, Lord, use them to bring the light and the love of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have my daughter Bethany and Ellie Miskell come up to the stage at this moment. Oh, I'm so sorry. I meant uh, Belle and Aurora. Is, is, um, how this is going to work is at the Connection Center, which is right under the TV. We, we have some teenagers. We, we, you can pay in cash or you can pay um, through the church app and just pick Speed the Light. Um, we have hot dogs. We have chips, water, pop. We have cotton candy, we have deep fried Oreos, we have face painting balloon animals, we have princesses, we have a lot of fun, grab your kids and family and, and hang out, it's going to be an awesome time. 100% of the proceeds is going to Speed the Light, which provides uh, transportation and sound equipment for missionaries. And so I asked uh, Bethany to come and, uh, I'm sorry, Aurora, to pray over the food. And is there anything else you want to say, instructions for the, uh, the after party, anything I missed? Okay. Okay. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great day. Let's have fun connecting as a church family and hope you guys have a great rest of your day. God bless you. Thank you for joining us online.